Hello, everyone. Welcome to IAPB's Focus on Glaucoma webinar, sponsored by IAPB in the North America region. Um, this is Suzanne Gilbert, IAPB North America region chair, and as well as the senior director of research and strategic opportunities for SEVA Foundation. I am delighted that uh, today we're able to have the fourth in a four-part glaucoma focus today, uh, sponsored by IAPB, the previous ones being in Europe, Africa, and Asia. The uh, I'm I am uh, representing the North America region in dedicating this session to Dr. James Standifer, professor of ophthalmology of the University of Minnesota, who recently passed away. Jim was a tremendous booster and mentor of glaucoma programming throughout the world. Uh, as most of you know, IEPB is the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. It was established in 1975 uh, as the coordinating umbrella organization to lead international efforts in blindness prevention around the world. Working closely with WHO, IEPB and WHO together have launched the Vision 2020, the Right to Sight program. Uh, I am uh, pleased to also thank the IPB coordinators who helped get us organized, Emma Foote and Teja Belentropu. And now I wish to introduce our uh, organizer for this session, Dr. Alan Robin. As many of you know, Alan Robin is a noted glaucoma specialist, executive vice president of the American Glaucoma Society, as well as longtime associate professor of ophthalmology and international health at Johns Hopkins, also adjunct professor of ophthalmology, University of Michigan, and well known as a longtime mentor and researcher along with the Arvind Eye Care System. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alan and ask him to give us an overview of this session. Thank you, Suzanne and Emma. Uh, I'm very proud to have some uh, world famous uh, investigators and researchers and clinicians with us today. Uh, all of them are well known and are up and coming stars who have already made it. Uh, we are positive we're going to start with an introduction to the epidemiology and the prevalence of glaucoma. We're then going to switch to what glaucoma does. It's more than being blind or not blind. And finally, with where we are today and where we will be in the future. I'd like to introduce Dr. Joshua Ehrlich, who is an assistant Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Michigan. Uh, Josh is received his medical degree from Cornell and his public health degree from Columbia. He completed an ophthalmology residency in the Wills, famous Wills Eye Hospital, and a fellowship in glaucoma at the University of Michigan. His clinical practice is focused on the medical and surgical care of glaucoma, cataracts, and diseases of the front of the eye. He aims to understand and alleviate adverse impact of vision loss on the quality of life. He's received funding from many institutions, such as the NIH, the American Glaucoma Society. Uh, he also co-directs the Kellogg Eye Center for International Ophthalmology, an IAP me member to which he is dedicated to international research and collaborations and eye care capacity building. Josh, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Alan and Suzanne, for that introduction. <clears throat> Today, as Alan mentioned, I'll be addressing questions about what exactly is glaucoma and who does it affect? So what is glaucoma? Glaucoma is a group of diseases that results in progressive damage to the optic nerve of the eye. The damage in glaucoma is often caused by higher eye pressure than the optic nerves able to tolerate However, different eyes are susceptible to glaucoma damage at different levels of eye pressure. <clears throat> the terms open and closed angle are important anatomic descriptions when we talk about glaucoma. These terms refer to whether fluid is able to reach the drainage system through which it would normally exit the eye, or 
whether access to that drain is closed off due to anatomic changes taking place in the eye. Glaucomas are commonly classified based on whether they are open or closed angle. And this has really important implications for epidemiology and for diagnostic and treatment considerations. As I noted, the optic nerve is the site of damage in glaucoma. So looking at this panel of images, the leftmost image here depicts a normal optic nerve. We can see that there's a white cup in the center of the optic nerve head that's surrounded by healthy pink neuroretinal rim tissue. The pink rim that I outlined is home to the nerve fibers that transmit signals from the photoreceptors of the eye all the way back to the brain. Moving now to the middle image of the panel, the white cup in the center of the optic nerve is considerably larger than in the prior picture. And this enlargement at the cup of the cup has resulted in loss of some of that healthy rim tissue. <clears throat> and then finally, in the rightmost image, we can see there's essentially no rim tissue remaining. And this is representative of a very advanced, a very advanced optic nerve cupping in glaucoma. We'd expect that an eye with this level of optic nerve damage would likely have severe vision loss. Now, vision loss in glaucoma usually starts with loss of peripheral vision. However, if the disease is untreated or progresses in spite of treatment, it can cause loss of central vision and even blindness. Significantly, vision loss due to glaucoma is irreversible. <clears throat> Through a number of, uh, of uh, important clinical and epidemiological studies, researchers have been able to identify important risk factors for glaucoma. We know that age is a critical risk factor as the prevalence of glaucoma increases considerably with each decade of life, especially after age 40. Although the genetics of glaucoma are very complex, we do know that there's a hereditary component to glaucoma risk <clears throat> as those with a close family member with the disease or those who have certain ancestry are at considerably higher risk for glaucoma. Intraocular pressure also plays a vital role. In fact, all currently available treatments, whether they're medical or surgical, seek to lower intraocular pressure, which is known to decrease the risk of disease progression. And as you can see, there are a number of other risk factors that are relevant to both individual patient care, as well as to population level, education, screening, and interventions. I'll shift gears a bit now uh, to discuss the epidemiology of glaucoma. What we know is that worldwide, more than 4 million people are blind from glaucoma, and that this makes glaucoma the number one cause of irreversible blindness globally. In 2013, the prevalence of glaucoma worldwide among adults age 40 to 80 was about 3.5%, and this corresponded to approximately 64 million individuals with the disease. When the prevalence of glaucoma is broken down into open angle and angle closure glaucoma, we can see that open angle disease accounts for the vast majority of glaucoma and that there are certain regions of the world, like Africa, where the prevalence of open angle glaucoma is considerably higher than average. Similarly, although angle closure glaucoma has a prevalence of about 0.5% worldwide, the prevalence in Asia is more than double the global average. Now, as the population ages and life expectancy continues to increase worldwide, we also expect to see a concomitant increase in the number of people with glaucoma, as this is a disease truly of aging. In fact, by 2020, it's projected that 76 million people will be affected. And between 2013 and 2040, the number with glaucoma is expected to more than double and reach 112 million people. The greatest increases in the number of people affected by glaucoma are anticipated in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. 
And shifting gears a bit, I'll speak for a few moments about the epidemiology of glaucoma now in North America specifically. In North America, about 15% of all blindness is due to glaucoma. This is compared to about 8.5% worldwide. And glaucoma is one of the two most important causes of irreversible blindness in North America. The prevalence of the disease in North America is about 3.5%, which is similar to the prevalence globally. And most glaucoma in this region is open-angle disease. Based on these estimates, approximately 3.4 million adults aged 40 to 80 had glaucoma in North America in 2013. <clears throat> Additionally, as in other regions of the world, demographic changes in North America are expected to result in more people with glaucoma in the years to come. Now, also importantly, as in many other locales worldwide, unfortunately, most cases of glaucoma in the United States remain undiagnosed. In fact, some studies have shown that up to 70% of people with glaucoma do not even know that they have the disease. Epidemiological studies have also shown that Blacks and Latinos in the U.S. may have a three to four times greater risk of glaucoma as compared to white individuals. And research has shown time and again that there are important disparities in glaucoma care that impede appropriate and equitable diagnosis and treatment of the disease. And so I'll conclude with a few words about where we're headed and I think what we can expect over the, uh, the coming years. It's quite clear that due to demographic and epidemiological changes, new systems of care will be greatly needed to address the rapidly growing burden of glaucoma in North America and throughout the world. Emerging technologies are very likely to play a crucial role in delivering this care in the years and the decades to come. And this includes technologies like telemedicine and artificial intelligence. But it is essential, both with old and new technologies, to ensure that this care is distributed equitably and that it reaches those most in need. And finally, it's also vital to keep in mind that blindness and disability from glaucoma can be prevented. Though there's much work to be done, I believe there's also reason for considerable optimism on this front. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. I'd like to rem remind the audience that if you have questions or want to ask any questions, you can either do that in the chat box or in the question section on the screen. Josh talked about disabilities due to glaucoma and blindness, and there's more than just blindness. It's more than blind and not blind. Uh, I'd like to introduce a good friend of mine, Dr. Pradeep Ramalu, uh, who is the head of the glaucoma service at the Wilmer Institute of Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital and Medical et Center. He is a graduate with honors from Stanford, joined the MD, PhD program at Hopkins, completing his PhD on rectal biology with Jeremy Nathans. He completed his ophthalmology residency at Hopkins at the Wilmer Institute and did a fellowship at the prestigious Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. After this, that, he returned to Wilmer and is now a well-respected international researcher. His main focus is to study the functional consequences of visual impairment. Uh, Dr. Romlu is on the board of almost every major uh, international uh, research and clinical society. And it's a great pleasure to have him with us today. And I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Ravala. Well, thank you, Alan. And thanks to, um, to the organizers. And uh, thanks to all those attending. And Josh, thank you for setting my talk up so well. So I'm going to talk about what glaucoma does to the individual. And these are my disclosures. I think it's important to think about what visual, visual disability is and why it's not the same as disability in other aspects of medicine. And maybe the most important reason is that visual disability is with the patient all the time, not only when they're performing certain tasks. I had a patient once who came in telling me that he didn't really want to seek low vision rehabilitation 
but he was using a cane. And when I was really pressing him to tell me the difference, it struck me that he only had to use the cane when he walked, whereas his visual disability was with him at every moment in time. And if we think about it, there's very few abilities uh, that we use during every waking moment. So our sight is certainly one of them. There might be others such as difficulty with breathing or chronic pain or changes in our mood or depression. But vision is certainly something that we engage every moment that we're awake. And in fact, there's almost no part of daily vision that is not affected by poor vision. If you think about washing and dressing, spending time with family, being able to work, your leisure time and sport, engaging with friends, doing daily activities such as shopping or eating, and even sleeping, all of these are affected by people with poor vision, people with poor vision, or if you have glaucoma specifically. People have looked at this formally, and if you look at a very nice study done now almost 15 years ago, they actually looked at the many, many different ways that glaucoma affects people. And it's much more than just not being able to do your uh, daily activities. Of course, that is one of the areas. So people um, have in focus groups and in review of uh, other literature have described difficulty watching TV or reading from a computer screen. And also they have difficulty specifically with mobility activities such as walking in dimly lit areas or crossing a street. Uh, and they also just have complaints of their vision such as it dim being dim or fluctuating. <clears throat> but there's many other things that result, some of it from our treatments. They can describe burning in the eyes or stickiness of the lashes, oftentimes from the eye drops or surgeries that they receive. They can have difficulty sleeping or dryness in their mouth or throat, again, from some of our treatments. Um, they, it's inconvenient for them to have to remember to take drops or to attend their appointments. They are fearful of going blind or losing their license. Uh, they can have trouble accepting their problems or embarrassed about having to ask for help. They can become disengaged from their social life, including their friends and family. And of course, especially in a developing world setting, the real world costs can be great both in terms of the cost of medications and the cost of either having to take time off of work to attend appointments or having to stop work altogether. One of the areas that we don't think about as being affected by glaucoma because we think of it as a peripheral vision disease is reading. But, and in fact, many people complain of reading when they have glaucoma, especially if their contrast is affected. They have trouble finding the next line of text and reading small print. This was studied formally in a study called the Salisbury Eye Evaluation, where they had people read short sentences, a very simple level uh, at different text sizes, using the glasses they were wearing for a short duration out loud. And they found that people only read slower if they had very severe glaucoma in both eyes. So only when the glaucoma was severe and bilateral did they read slower by about 30 words per minute and were they more likely to be reading impaired. However, a lot of people actually describe difficulty to me in my clinical work when they have problems that are much less severe, even when they have early disease, but it's never when they're just doing brief reading. It's often when they're reading for a long period of time, such as when reading a book or if they're employed, if they're having to do prolonged computer work. And indeed, we found that reading silently for uh, long durations of time was much more effective than out loud reading. And in fact, the, uh, the effect was much more uh, substantial, about 17% or 32 words per minute, as compared to only about 13 words per minute for just simply reading out loud. And um, they, we found this for several other things as well, that the impact on, out loud, on silent reading was greater than the impact on out loud reading. Of course, in, even when they did read slower, they also seemed to understand less. So a lot of the compensations that people make or to simply try and keep up their same speed, even though may, they may not be understanding the text quite as well. We also noticed that if you look at an average individual over a prolonged duration of reading, that their speed of reading doesn't change very much. But if you look at the average glaucoma person, they start out reading slower, but they tend to have a downward trend in their reading speed, suggesting that they may get tired, which can really affect younger patients who have severe glaucoma but need to work by reading or on a computer for prolonged periods of time. At least in North America and perhaps other parts of the world as well, independence relies on driving and that if you can't drive, you're more likely to become depressed 
or enter into a situation where somebody else has to care for you. In the United States, unfortunately, at least, it's the primary mode of transportation and people highly value this function. So we found that glaucoma, as it became more severe, was more likely to cause somebody to have to stop driving to the point where once you had lost a moderate amount of vision, that you were about 50% likely to have stopped driving already. Of course, you do find some people with very severe vision loss who continue to drive, and this might be a separate problem. Uh, it's, it's a problem because those individuals with severe vision loss who continue to drive are more risky. People have shown that their crash rates per mile are more severe. And they also, if you have somebody in the car with them observing how they drive, they seem to make more mistakes as well, uh, either failing a, a driving inspector's observation or having somebody else have to intervene to make sure that they don't get into a dangerous situation. We thought that if people drove less, that they may actually leave their home less, which of course leads to a more isolated life. And then a more isolated life is associated with a higher mortality. It can affect your brain because you don't interact with the world as much, and it can make you more frail and disabled. So as part of one study we did here at Johns Hopkins, we actually watched how much people leave their home using a tracker that they wore for a week. And we found that glaucoma caused people to be about twice as likely to not leave their home on a given day. Uh, in fact, it may also be the medications that do this, because when we look specifically whether, whether it was the glaucoma that made this worse or their medications, one specific medication actually seemed to really increase the risk of not being able to leave their home or not choosing to leave their home on a given day, perhaps even more than the disease itself. Um, if you have poor vision, does it also cause you to cut back on how much your physical activity you do? Of course, this is an important question because people who are more physically active are more healthy. They have a lower mortality rate. They have less heart disease, less diabetes, less osteoporosis, and they're more happy and they have a better quality of life. We found that people who had more severe visual field damage also did less physical activity as shown here and so on with increasing levels of glaucoma damage shown by a depiction on the visual field test where the darkness indicates more damage to the field of vision, people's average daily steps decreased. So as their glaucoma became more severe, they became less active. We saw the same thing in another cohort that was look, that, that is a publicly available large population-based study called the NHANES that was conducted out of America. And we found that people who had visual field damage in both eyes did about 30% less physical activity as compared to those with normal sight. And you can see the impact of visual field damage was comparable to many other conditions. And in fact, it was worse than arthritis, similar to diabetes, and just short of very disabling conditions such as congestive heart failure or stroke. Finally, physical activity puts one at risk for falls, which is a significant public health issue. It's the leading cause of accidental death in older adults in the United States. It leads to many hospitalizations, a tremendous amount of costs, and of course, its rate is tied to physical activity. In a study that we just completed, we found that a significant portion of glaucoma patients experienced an injurious fall over a two-year period of time. In fact, nearly half of our patients that we studied in our, in our cohort uh, had a fall by two years of follow-up. Um, we also found that they were more likely um, to fall, especially if you account for how many steps they took. In other words, their walking was more dangerous. So uh, they had a trend towards more falls per year, but for every step they took, there was a higher rate of falls if they had worse uh, visual field damage. And certainly vision is not the only thing that influences fall rates. Other things do such as age and comorbid illness, although uh, visual fields was a primary um, variable here. Um, we also found that it affected both their fall rates at home and away from home, and it had a particularly high effect if they were walking away from home. This also results in more fear of falling. So as you have uh, more uh, falls, it not only can affect you physically, but also emotionally. And we looked at this with a specific fear of falling questionnaire, which asked people how fearful they were performing various activities. And we found that those with glaucoma had significantly more fear of falling than those without glaucoma, and this became worse as they had more uh, damage to their field of vision. 
Unfortunately, people don't tend to fix their own problems. So in this study, we actually looked at whether people with uh, various degrees of vision, visual field damage kept their home any better. In other words, had fewer hazards within their home. And what you see here are people with different degrees of damage shown in black, gray, and light. And we looked at the number of hazards in different areas of their home. And you would think that people who have more damage, the black group, would show uh, fewer hazards because they would understand that they have a risk of falls and keep their home better. But in fact, you see no association. And so it's a very prominent negative result where those who have more damage have just as many hazards in their home as those who have less damage. And we see the same thing with lighting as well. They don't tend to increase their lighting anymore beyond people who have uh, less damage. So I think we should think of glaucoma as a blinded disease, but even those who are not blind are often profoundly affected. It affects multiple daily functions, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be an end-stage disease to have an affected individual. So it's very important not only to find those end-stage conditions and treat those, but to really find the disease early and get people before they move on to even moderate levels of disease where they can have substantial disability and become make it difficult for them to live healthy and to work. Thank you, thank you Pradeep. That was really beautifully done. And I think the message that is carried forth from Dr. Ehrlich's talk to Dr. Romelu's talk is that we want to catch glaucoma early, that it is treatable. That's really important. It is not untreatable. It is treatable and we can preserve the vision you have. Uh, so far, we can't make any better, but we can preserve the vision we you have. Again, remember, if you have questions in the audience, please put them in either the question area or the chat area of the questionnaire. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Paula Ann Newman Casey, who's a clinical ophthalmologist specializing in the medical and surgical management of glaucoma. Uh, this gives her a deep awareness of the difficulties patients face in the managing their glaucoma. She's an assistant professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center. She completed medical school, residency, and fellowship at the University of Michigan. She holds a master's degree in health services research. Her current research includes developing and testing technology-based behavioral interventions to improve glaucoma self-management and co-opting low-cost technologies to improve patient healthcare, provider communication, and chronic disease monitoring. Paula Ann is going to talk to us about the current state of therapy and what lies in the future. Paula Ann, Dr. Newman Casey, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, Alan. So today I'm going to be discussing glaucoma, present therapies, current problems, and the future. And let's just say... So uh, for an overview, I'm going to go through the evidence behind present surgical and medical therapies for glaucoma, why people don't accept glaucoma surgery, why people don't take their glaucoma medications, and some possible solutions. So as Josh was, uh, Dr. Ehrlich was discussing, there's about 61 million cases of glaucoma worldwide, and of those cases, 8.4 million people are bilaterally blind. This makes glaucoma the second leading cause of blindness in the world um, and the leading cause of irreversible blindness. However, uh, effective treatments for glaucoma, as uh, Dr. Robin so aptly pointed out, do exist. The Collaborative Initial Glaucoma Treatment Study was a randomized, controlled, multi-center clinical trial that compared initial treatment with medications to trabeculectomy surgery for 607 participants with newly diagnosed glaucoma and they followed those people at six month intervals for up to 14 years. And this graph shows that there was no difference in glaucoma related vision loss between the group treated with medication and the group treated with surgery. Both groups did remarkably well with only about a three decibel loss of visual field, not very much over nine years of follow up. This tells us that close follow up and keeping intraocular pressure well controlled halts the progression of glaucoma over time. The United Kingdom Glaucoma Treatment Study assessed the impact of medication on visual field progression. 
They randomized 516 patients with newly diagnosed open angle glaucoma to treatment with latanoprost or placebo, and they followed for visual field deterioration and progression over two years. After two years, they found a remarkable 66% reduction in the risk of developing progressive vision loss in the group treated with latanoprost compared to the placebo group. The trial was even stopped early because of the evident benefit of treatment. So we have these effective treatments, and yet many people do not use them. In the US, about 50% of people do not take their glaucoma medications as prescribed. In one study, they found that 40% of people newly diagnosed with glaucoma had not filled their prescription within two months of receiving the script. In Ethiopia, 57% of patients in one study reported poor glaucoma medication adherence. In our survey of, a survey of patients in Madurai, Tamil Nadu, India, 40% of patients self-reported poor medication adherence. So we can see that poor glaucoma medication adherence is a worldwide problem. Researchers in Nigeria conducted focus groups to understand patients' perspectives on why they were not adhering to recommended glaucoma treatments. They held six focus groups with patients with advanced glaucoma. Patients identified cost and forgetfulness as main reasons for poor adherence to medical treatment and fear as a main reason for poor acceptance of surgery. So when we're thinking about poor acceptance of glaucoma surgery because of the of fear of the surgery itself, I think looking at how cataract surgery uptake has changed in the last few de decades in certain areas is a useful paradigm for gaining insight. I'm going to use the example of the Aravind Eye Care Hospital in Tamil Nadu, India as a case study. In 1990, they conducted a field trial to compare the effects of two different economic incentives on cataract surgery uptake among 19,000 adults in 90 villages throughout Tamil Nadu. The percentage of cataract awareness and cataract surgery uptake were measured eight months after the intervention. The two economic incentives they tested were free surgery and free glasses compared to free everything. The free everything included free surgery, free glasses, free transportation to the hospital, and free meals and accommodation during the hospital stay. Compared to the control group in which cataract surgical acceptance was 14%, giving free cataract surgery and free glasses did not really increase the cataract surgery uptake, while giving free everything essentially doubled the cataract surgical acceptance rate to approximately 27%. In 1990, when the field trial was conducted, 37,000 people were being operated for cataract annually at Aravind, and 85% of patients required aphakic spectacles. In 1992, Oral Lab, Aravind's manufacturing facility, began manufacturing low-cost intraocular lenses, and by 1998, 90% of patients had phaco emulsification with lens implantation. In 1999, small incision cataract surgery with intraocular lens implantation was introduced and slowly overtook extracapsular cataract surgery as the main approach to treating cataracts. This had improved visual outcomes, less dependence on glasses, and a faster recovery time. By 2007, Aravind was operating on 180,000 cataracts annually, and only 12% of cases required extracapsular cataract extraction. Improving outcomes led to improved uptake. In 2017, after technologies and outcomes for cataract surgery had greatly improved, when Aravind researchers sought to identify barriers to cataract surgery uptake again, they had very different results. The researchers asked 1,271 people whether they were willing to pay for cataract surgery, and 85% said yes. An additional 11% were willing to have cataract surgery if it was free, and only 4% were not willing to have it at all. This is really different from the 14% of people who were willing to pay to have cataract surgery in 1990. As glaucoma surgery outcomes improve, which may come from combining glaucoma surgery with cataract surgery, or may come from some newer surgical interventions, glaucoma surgery uptake may also increase. Rigorous training for glaucoma surgery around the world will be necessary to impact this outcome. So now that we've discussed key barriers to glaucoma surgical uptake, 
fear of worse vision, cost of surgery and lodging and transportation, we will discuss key barriers to medication adherence among glaucoma patients. In the focus group study in Nigeria, researchers identified cost and forgetfulness as main reason for low adherence to medical treatment. Dr. Uni and Dr. Ferris explored the idea of whether forgetfulness was related to concerns about medications, or perhaps a lack of belief in the necessity of the medicine. So they found that patients who forgot to take their medication were significantly more likely to report having concerns about their medications. The fact that patient concerns were related to forgetting is important, as it means that we can't always take our patient's word at face value when they say that they just forgot to take their glaucoma drops. We probably need to probe deeper to explore whether they also have concerns about their medication or other reasons that they haven't voiced for not taking their medication. In focus groups, patients have identified a number of barriers to glaucoma medication adherence. Problems in stealing eye drops, poor glaucoma knowledge, skepticism that glaucoma will cause future vision loss, skepticism that the medications will help, life stress, forgetfulness, side effects, medication costs, difficulty with the medication schedule, and a lack of trust in their doctor. We conducted a study to identify whether there were one or two barriers patients might identify as the obstacles to their glaucoma medication adherence. And we surveyed 190 glaucoma patients. We found that there was not one barrier that no one thought was important. Each of the 11 barriers were important to at least some of the glaucoma patients. Another way of saying this is well summed up by Tolstoy in the opening line of Anna Karenina. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. While patients who are adherent likely share certain common traits, they believe that the situation is serious, that their medication will help them, and they're used to forming habits to meet their goals. Patients who are not adherent each have their own unique set of issues, both material and psychological, that keep them from engaging in their glaucoma treatment. One huge systematic barrier is that as physicians, we are very busy. We often feel that our job is done after we've completed all the testing, assessed it for accuracy, interpreted the findings, made a diagnosis, identified appropriate treatment, and written the prescription, which is a lot of work. But I would propose that we try to think about our job not being done when we've written the prescription, but when the patient is actually doing better. That means making sure that the patient has the resources, the knowledge, the money, the physical ability, the reminder systems in place to take the medications that we've prescribed. Another important barrier to optimal glaucoma medication adherence is how hard it is for some patients to get the drops into their eye, and not everyone has someone at home to help. Dr. Stone and colleagues conducted a study assessing how 139 glaucoma patients took their drops through structured video recordings the patients were also asked if they had any problems in stealing their drops. Of 129 people who said they had no problems whatsoever in stealing their drops, 22 could not get a drop into their eye. And of the 80 people who said they never missed their eye, 20 did. So though our glaucoma patients think they're not having any issues with eye drop installation, we really don't know what issues they're having unless we watch them. So are we doing enough to teach eye drop installation? Dr. Sleeth and her colleagues video recorded 279 patient visits with 15 glaucoma physicians in four states where patients were prescribed a new glaucoma medication. At over 80% of visits, physicians did not address people's fears, concerns, or barriers, or whether the patient wanted a brand or generic medication. No physicians mentioned that drops will be used forever, and only 16% taught how to administer the eye drops. But what was fascinating about this was that even though there were very few physicians who engaged patients in education and counseling about glaucoma medications, providers who did conferred a 337% increased chance of good medication adherence. This important research points us in the direction of how we might address this problem. A Cochrane review of interventions to improve glaucoma medication adherence found that there was some evidence that education combined with personalized interventions improved adherence. We conducted a systematic review of counseling and education interventions meant to improve glaucoma medication adherence, and we found that the studies that had significantly impacted adherence had personalized their educational materials to meet their patients' needs. The most common way that all of the successful educational sessions were personalized was through having a counselor or the study coordinator 
sit with the patient and discuss their barriers to care and brainstorm solutions. But the prevalence of glaucoma is projected to rise as the population ages, and workforce shortages are predicted for ophthalmologists even in high-income countries. So how can we reconcile our need to provide personalized care for our patients with the need for physicians to provide care to so many people? Harnessing health information technology to bring more standardized and yet individualized education to patients is going to help bring us closer to an answer that helps address both the psychological, knowledge-based, and concrete barriers that patients have to taking their glaucoma medications. On top of education, we also need to find ways to motivate patients to want to take care of their vision. In a world where there are increasing demands on physicians' time, training paraprofessional staff to provide personalized education and counseling to patients can extend the reach of our eye care teams. Programs where credentialed paraprofessionals provide self-management support for patients is already standard of care for people with diabetes. Training paraprofessional staff to provide services that improve human health and allow the physician to spend more time on medical decision-making and surgery is called task shifting and is recommended by the World Health Organization as a strategy to increase, increase the reach of the healthcare team. The counseling activities delivered by paraprofessional staff can be supported through the use of innovative programs that personalize information to a patient's needs, such as explaining a person's glaucoma testing results compared to a normal test, and include prompts for the staff to facilitate conversations with patients about their issues surrounding their glaucoma self-management. That way, the medical content can be standardized yet personalized so that paraprofessional staff can have a conversation with the patient that only used to be possible through an extended conversation with the physician. Such programs have been tested and shown to improve glycemic control for people with diabetes and have promised to help improve glaucoma patient self-management as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much, Paul Ann, and I wanna really thank all of the speakers uh, there has been uh, one set of questions submitted by the audience so far, uh, but before we do that, uh, there are some other questions that I have for all the speakers. And the first one is to Dr. Ehrlich. Uh, from your talk, there's a lot of people who don't know they have glaucoma. And my question is, if I was somebody who, who should get screened for glaucoma, and what should be done in a screening or a, an examination so that I would know that I really do or don't have glaucoma? And what is the, what is the audience that really should get screened? Jo Dr. Ehrlich, please. Yeah, thanks, Alan. I think that's a, that's a very important and, uh, and certainly timely question. Um, it's true that there's a huge number of individuals, uh, both in North America and the United States, in the United States, as well as uh, in other countries, that have undiagnosed glaucoma. There's no question about that. And I think you've um, touched on two important points. Uh, one is, should we be screening people? And one is, who should get an eye exam? Um, and those aren't necessarily, the answer's not necessarily the, uh, the same for both of those. Um, the work that's been done in the realm of screening has largely shown that population-based screening is most effective uh, and most cost-effective in those who are already a priori at high risk. So this may have to do with ancestry, family history, et cetera. Uh, so screening for high risk groups, there may be some benefit for. Um, and then eye exams, I think we can look to some professional organization recommendations uh, that recommend that older adults um, get eye exams on a uh, annual or semi-annual basis, not only because of glaucoma, but because other diseases of aging like cataract, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy also increase in prevalence with age. Uh, so certainly people of older age should be getting eye exams, um, and certainly screening in higher risk groups is, uh, is, it, it may, be warrant, may be warranted. Um, the final component, I think, to, 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 to answer your question is to say that I think that there are going to be new technologies on the horizon that may shake all of this up a little bit and cause some, some, some changes. And that is, as we see uh, telemedicine applications and artificial intelligence, uh, perhaps reaching more and more people and showing greater, uh, uh, greater effectiveness uh, and ability to detect disease uh, remotely, 
we may find that there are new algorithms and new uh, strategies for screening that do turn out to be effective. Uh, so I think that's something for the future um, that we ought, ought to all be keeping an eye out for. Uh, but in the meantime, we can look toward uh, um, we can look toward what uh, what I discussed in terms of who uh, who might benefit from screening and from eye exams. Hey, thank you, uh, Doctor. Look, I have one more question for you, which is is just checking your pressure enough? That's one of the things that people always ask. And I was curious as what you think about that. Yeah. So just checking pressure is not enough. Um, there is, in some screening settings, adding pressure to other screening metrics, um, like OCT metrics, um, have been found to increase the sensitivity of finding glaucoma. That is, uh, increase the, the positive predictive value or the likelihood that one who screens positive has the disease. However, we know that lots of people have glaucoma at, one, at what one might consider to be a, quote, normal pressure, which in many clinical trials has been defined as less than 21 millimeters of mercury. But, uh, but many people have glaucoma at a pressure less than that. So relying only on intraocular pressure uh, would certainly miss uh, many people with, uh, with substantial disease. Um, and therefore, that can't be our only metric. We know that different eyes can withstand different intraocular pressures. Some can withstand a higher pressure than others, and therefore that's not an across-the-board uh, uh, appropriate way to screen. Hey, thank you very much, Don. Uh, uh, for Dr. Romulo, you made some excellent points about, it, you know, different problems that people have that they may not be aware of. How do you suggest that patients communicate these with uh, with their doctors? Is there any way that doctors can try to bring them out? Uh, I know that most exams deal with just pressures and fields and OCTs, but how can we make uh, the patients let their doctors know that there's more to it than just those um, variables? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Alan. I think that, uh, I mean, it's important to have these discussions with patients, and I know they can be quite challenging in a, in a time-limited setting. But I think it is really important to listen to what patients say with regards to the types of problems that they're having, and also you know, the, the specific words that they use to describe their difficulty. I mean, a lot of times, even though patients have damage to their side vision, you know, they'll often describe uh, difficulty that kind of reflects their difficulty with contrast. So a lot of people will say that their vision is like they're looking through a cloud or they're looking through a fog. But of course, all these words may differ quite dramatically depending on where you're from and the type of population that you're uh, interacting with and the types of words that they use. So I think it, it probably is incumbent on us to, to learn how our patients who have glaucoma describe things and to listen out for those cues, not only to know if they might have the disease, uh, but if things are getting worse. And I think this is a useful supplement to, to the testing that we, uh, that we talked about as well, and also the ophthalmic exam. It can help us not only tell whether patients have the disease, but how bad it is, and also maybe what the cause of their poor vision is. Hey, thank, thank you, Dr. Ramu. Another question for you is, it's, it looked from your slides uh, as a layperson that the worse the disease, the worse your visual function from reading to mobility to likelihood of falls and many other things. Uh, so does it really matter? Should somebody be caught early? Does that make a difference in how they'll function five or 10 years later? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there was, you know, there may have been in the past this idea that there's kind of a cliff that you fall off of that, you know, the, that the, that the impact of the disease is, you know, virtually nil until you get to um, kind of a moderate or severe stage of the disease. And then afterwards that each, each additional um, decrement in vision or worsening of vision has a, has a dramatic impact on you. And I think increasingly that's not true. So it's being shown that that's not true. So even at the earlier stage of the disease, uh, there are impacts on your chance of falling or maybe how fast you read or your ability to sustain reading or, um, you know, whether you choose to stop driving or not. It may not be so bad that patients even realize it. It may almost be subclinical, 
but uh, make no mistake that they actually are being affected. And so it really is important to catch the disease early because uh, on an on a individual and a population level, you know, catching people before those things happen is a benefit to them. Just because they don't notice that it's happening to them and that they're affected doesn't mean that they haven't already been affected. Hey, thank you, Dr. Rama. That's a great answer and a very important question. Uh, one of the questions just came from the eyes, and I'll answer this so I have some say, is does it, glaucoma usually affect both eyes? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, most of the time. Uh, most times in primary open angle glaucoma, which is the most common form in the United States and North America, and also in uh, primary angle closure glaucoma, which is much more common uh, in parts of Asia uh, than in the U.S. and in specific population groups. It usually is bilateral, and it usually is um, asymmetrical. That is, one eye could be much more advanced than the other. Often there are types of glaucoma caused by diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, trauma, inflammation that are only unilateral or in one eye, but on the whole, they're bilateral. Uh, Dr. Newman Casey, you talked about uh, a little bit the future of what's going on. Uh, I have two questions for you. One is uh, one of the audience members asked, what about stem cells? What about optic nerve transplants? Uh, and the second question by the same uh, individual was basically that despite everything, his vision is going down or his glaucoma is getting worse. Uh, how, do, how would you handle that or what would you suggest to this person? Uh, thank you for those, those questions, Alan. So I think uh, in terms of stem cell therapy, you know, that there is actually research going on right now on stem cell therapy for macular uh, problems. So, so being able to regenerate the retina is a retinal cells, retinal progenitor cells, is something that is currently under trial. Um, it has so so there is potential in the future. Um, for stem cells to help glaucoma patients, but the future may still be 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, I, I think there's there's a, a lot more work that needs to be done to make sure that uh, stem cell therapies are safe and effective, both for uh, for degenerations of the retina and degenerations of the optic nerve uh, that include glaucoma. So, so I, I think that's that's probably not not going to help anyone currently. So for the person who's wondering uh, what they can do because their glaucoma is still getting worse, I would recommend really following closely with their doctor, making sure they have a good relationship with their doctor, and bringing these questions to the table and asking, you know, is there anything more to be done? Um, you know, that's. That's something where sometimes getting multiple multiple opinions is helpful. Um, there are many new therapies coming to market and many new surgeries. And you know, your doctor would be the one who would be able to kind of tailor the treatment to to best suit your disease. Paul oh, Ann, thank you very much. Uh, I, there is some current uh, research going on at the University of Iowa by uh, John Fingert and Bud Tucker on stem cell therapy. I think that in individuals uh, who are, feel that they're getting worse, perhaps they should seek help from a glaucoma specialist that's nearby or perhaps get a second opinion. It's always good to get a second opinion, at least I believe that. Um, one of the questions that's come about to to me and is, uh, I guess for any of the panelists who would like to answer it, is uh, how, do, how do you think it would be best for us to let our patients know that there are new therapies available? I, I think Paul Ann was uh, mentioned that better surgeries, uh, but perhaps to Paul Ann there, are, there is uh, a new um, technology from Glaucos, the IDOS, there is the 
bromonidine or bromida pro sorry sr that will be released there's a lot of emphasis on newer surgical interventions what do you think the future is going to be there well, I think anything that makes it easier for patients to take their medications is, is a wonderful innovation. And I think some people might really have great benefit from having their doctor inject their medication into their eye or put in a depot form or use a contact lens that's embedded with medication. And there's, there's different delivery platforms um, that different companies are testing for giving people long-acting glaucoma medications so that they don't have to put the medications in themselves every day. I think especially for folks who are having trouble getting the eye drops in their eye, this could be really revolutionary. I think um, one, of the, one of the big issues with these new technologies is that um, if people don't take their medications now using, using their eye drop medications in their current form, they're also less likely to come back on time for their glaucoma checkups. And if you were to get an injected form of a glaucoma medication and not come back in time for your checkup, you would have a long period of time where you had absolutely no coverage. And we know that, that large swings in intraocular pressure are not good for the optic nerve and can cause increased degeneration. So if you were to opt for getting a, a kind of a longer term glaucoma medication injected at your doctor's office every three months or every six months, it would be very important to be on time for your follow-up visits and to continue to come in to get that glaucoma medication implanted by your doctor. And that may be much more convenient for, for many people. Thank you, Dr. Newman Casey. I'm gonna make a few comments and then uh, we'll thank everybody so that we can end on time. Uh, first, I'm sure that many, I want to thank all the speakers again who have done a spectacular job of both presentation and uh, answering questions and have addressed most of the people's questions. Two, I'm sure many of the participants will have questions that they weren't sure about or maybe not understood or may have further questions about glaucoma. And may I suggest that they go to either the American Glaucoma Society mm -hmm. website, mm -hmm. which will answer that, the Glaucoma Research Foundation prevent website, blindness. Prevent Blindness website. Uh, those are three good ones. IAPB, IEF also have websites. And I think uh, these are great. Let me repeat that. That is IAPB, IEF, the American Glaucoma Society, Prevent blindness, uh, and the Hopkins or Wilmer Institute website and the Kellogg Institute of the University of Michigan. Uh, we are finishing two minutes early, which I think is a world record. I'd like to thank everybody and thank IAPB for their wonderful work. And may everybody have a wonderful day, no matter what part of the world they're in. And may glaucoma be treatable, and may you all have a great vision. <laughs>